There are a number of different types of photography to be studied. There's fashion photography, wedding photography, advertising photography, and what some call photojournalism, to name a few. The focus of this piece is primarily focused on photojournalism. In saying that, more specifically, the focus will be on documentary photography, which falls under the auspices of photojournalism. My name is Cecil Williams, and I'd like to share some stories about my life as a photographer. Uh, at nine years old, I started taking pictures, um, attracted by the fact that I could, that was my hustle. I found out that on Sunday, I could go down to Edison Gardens here in Orangeburg, and uh, people would pay me one dollar, and I would have the pictures taken. And my camera was a hand-me-down camera from my brother. And so, what happened is I grew up in the segregated um, society that, that I came up in. Um, people called upon me to take photographs of things like birthday parties and weddings and things like that. When I was 12 years old, I shot my first wedding. But the NAACP, which was very strong during the days that I'm speaking about here, um, wanted to document these conditions that, that affected our lives. And often the local, state, and federal uh, um, or, or national, people, national offices of the NAACP would ask me to take pictures for them. So had it not been maybe for the experiences and the opportunities that came about by covering things because of the segregated society I lived in, it might have been that I would not have been as successful a photographer um, as I think that I have accomplished. William's style of photography, for, while being highly successful in event, wedding, candid, and portrait photography, became famous for its photographed images representing a moment or moments in history that added colorful stories and meaning to pertinent civil issues. During time periods of civil unrest, Williams presented images that represented incidents in the truest form. His photographs captured bloodshed, tears, bruises, actions and reactions, and narrated without words, stories of pure emotion that can be seen by the observer. If there is one idea that is agreeable among many, it is the idea that photography is not what is seen by reality and what is actually being observed. Photography represents the unseen through the eyes of the photographer. Well, a lot of times the photographs that I was called on were to document people doing things, people um, uh, achieving um, various um, uh, and overcoming various obstacles. But a lot of times, um, as I was in high school um, and called upon by NAACP officials to photograph uh, events that were going on in the streets of Orangeburg, it was the students that were really had taken on um, the fight to overcome the racial prejudices and the system that governed them. And so it was my great opportunity to not only be a student who was marching and demonstrating and making signs against segregation, but also one that was photographing and documentary. So in a way, I was a participant, but uh, as well, I was a documentary uh, photographer of that um, movement as well. Through individual study of various photographic forms, it seems that photography can tell us an entire story without verbal narration. The use of the lens helps for interpretation. Close-ups, candid shots, spontaneous movement and action shots also help with narration. Williams talks of his still images and shares thoughts about what is now called the Orangeburg Massacre of 1968, where three black South Carolina State students died and 28 injured. Orangeburg was a hard place to integrate because the case we know, or the situation we know of, is the Orangeburg Massacre, in fact, occurred because in 1968, even though throughout America, other places and barriers had fallen, we were able to shop where we wanted to, we were able to go movies on interstate travel, we were able to sit on airplanes where we wanted to, schools were beginning to integrate. But in 1968, if you were a student walking downtown, going towards leaving Claflin or state and walking towards the city limits of Orangeburg and into the um, main street of Orangeburg to shop, you would have seen a sign by the Orangeburg bowling alley that said white only regarding the bowling alley. So that barrier had not fallen yet. So the students at State and Claflin and Wilkinson um, on February the 8th in a confrontation near the campus of South Carolina State Three students died, and over 250 were involved in this movement. 1968 was a turbulent time in the U.S., 
and as history and photographs would account, the impact of the Orangeburg Massacre on the small rural town of Orangeburg, South Carolina was great, but the national impact was not so. Much to the credit of Williams, individuals are continuing to become educated about the tragic events that took place and left a small South Carolina town in tears, anguish, and even more separated than before. I grew up in an era where we had very um, uh, great barriers in front of us and they were very open. Uh, you had state and federal authorities that would call blacks niggers on intel in interviews and, and um, we, we were abused as a group of people. We did not have the rights such as voting as you have. If we wanted to go to a movie theater during the days that I came up, I would have to go either upstairs. I was never together. It was a separate, parallel society that I grew up in. The schools naturally were, were segregated. I'm often um, uh, influenced, and, and one of my um, mentors is an illustrator um, that, um, that I have tried. Norman Rockwell, a great American artist uh, who is now deceased, um, I often try to imitate his work in that in every work that he puts out, he was an artist, there's nothing in the photograph that does not lend itself to the storytelling parts of whatever he's trying to do. During a visit to my aunt and uncle in New York during the semester break, I read in the newspaper that John F. Kennedy would be at the, um, uh, at the Roosevelt Hotel. So. Not having a press credential with me at the time, even though I worked for JET, I went down to the Roosevelt Hotel, went in to the hotel, and I was, my purpose there was I was going to try and photograph, um, again, Senator John F. Kennedy, who was going to make an appearance there. It was not said what he was going to be doing there. But as it turned out, John, uh, uh, before he approached the podium, the security people at the hotel were going to throw me out, because again, this is New York, and it's still a time period, even in New York, where things are segregated. There are very few black journalists uh, even there. And as they were about to bounce me out, in the corner of my eye, I saw John F. Kennedy, Senator John F. Kennedy, and Jacqueline Kennedy coming through the doorway. And he saw the uh, security people about to bounce me out of the room, and he stopped them, and uh, he asked what I was doing, that kind of thing, and I told him I was a photographer and I wanted to cover. And um, he uh, asked me to sit, really, on the front seat. And so I got great picture opportunities that are in my books today about, of John F. Kennedy. By the way, he took the technique that he did in asking me to, to remain a part of his press conference later on when Martin Luther King is jailed in Alabama. So the President of the United States got, John F., uh, got Martin Luther King out of jail at the request of Bobby Kennedy, who was then the Attorney General. So he used that technique many times during his short administration. The worst time, I guess, would then have to be um, with um, the arrest. The fact that um, when you're arrested by police authorities for any reason, it is it's a very um, unsettling moment in your life. You don't know what's going to happen. But if you were arrested by police authorities in the day and era that I'm talking about, it was very dangerous, as we see in Mississippi, where actually some people arrested we really never heard of again. So. Um, I'm happy that, um, or, or very, um, I'm, I feel very fortunate that no harm ever came to me uh, as a result of all the activities. Many times as I covered events for the Civil Rights Movement though, the authorities would try and get in touch with my father who was a tailor here in Orangeburg or my mother who was a school teacher and put pressure on them to keep me in line. But um, they would tell me, but they would also tell me um, to that I should they knew what I was doing, and they told me to continue and just be careful, but um, continue doing what I was doing. There's a picture on the front of one of my books of a little boy holding his mother's hand. And I think that picture is the, it, it epitomizes really the civil rights movement, and uh, it's one of my favorites. Also, there's a picture of uh, Harvey Gantt uh, at the moment he achieved the integration at Clemson University, where I was the official photographer for JET covering that. It can be said, William's work heralds in likeliness of photography greats. His photography clearly gives an indication of the importance of this art form. 
Technology has made it possible to go beyond the obvious frames and go into the realm of unseen in some cases. Photography is a combination of the expertise of the photographer and techniques, but in the true sense, an excellent photographer would only need creativity and observation to be able to capture visuals that encompass sights seen and unseen, emotions felt and portrayed, and words spoken and not. When you take a photograph, um, a, a little opposed to maybe doing video or, or filmmaking, that kind of thing, you really take it only a fraction of a second. And I've always tried to, uh, in the photography that I do, to capture the essence of the moment, to freeze that moment in time so that whatever I'm trying to do, it tells a story. That's what picture taking does, it tells a story. It's, a, it, it's a, really a compelling moment that you have decided that you're gonna mash the shutter to capture an image and, and to, so that your image will um, ha say have that results that it does.